Hello, good evening. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for your forbearance. Please enjoy your dinner while we get to talk a bit. Uh, and Naomi, thank you especially for joining us. Five countries in five days, did I hear that right? Yes. That's a, that's a whirlwind that would challenge even the most. Uh, I mean, I don't mind. It's like when I'm driven to do something, I'm going to do it. So sleep comes secondary. So what was that itinerary? <laughs> that was Cannes, Germany, Germany, London, five hours, Moscow for a day, night, Japan, 48 hours, then back to Monaco, then to Spain, and then to New York. Wow. All right. Take that. You, uh. <laughs> so the theme of, the, of Most Powerful Women this year, finding your new power. And in a way, I can't imagine anyone who speaks to that uh, more eloquently than you can, having, having at 15 entered the fashion modeling phase, expanded into acting, into entrepreneurship, into philanthropy. Um, so I'm curious about what's the roughest workplace, the runway, the TV set, hmm. the retail world. None of it's rough, because I commit to doing it, so I want to be there. Um, I mean, there are times on TV when you have to hurry up and wait, and that's because, you know, you got to shoot a few scenes over and over, and, um, but it's all, it's all learning experience. It's great. I get to watch all these great actors just, you know, learn, do their craft and do it at their best, and so I'm learning the whole time that I'm watching them. And you, you went to theater school or acting as a child, so that was not a totally I did. New... I went to two schools in London. One was in East Acton, and that was run by Barbara Speaks and Phil Collins' mother, June Collins. And then the second one was um, Italia Conte, which is in the Barbican. And I'm still very close to my school friends. I've shot with them many times for British Vogue, with Bruce Weber recently, and my headmistress. So we keep, you know, I've, I mean, these are the people that really know me. It keeps me grounded, and I'm very happy to have them in my life. This is a. This may seem like a perverse question to ask someone who's had an extraordinary career in the world of of beauty and fashion. But I'm thinking particularly in your acting incarnation. Have you ever felt your appearance was a liability? Mm, yeah, maybe I have at some point. I mean, I was just asked recently to play myself in something, and I thought that was definitely a liability. And um, it was a liability in many ways, liability to upset someone that I love very much, that I've had a relationship with for 30 years, and also to bring up an issue of a tragedy that was really not worth it for me. So as great as this director was, I dug down, and it didn't take me too much, too much to think about it. I just said no, because it's not worth it. It took me to a dark place when it actually happened 20 years ago. And after the 20th anniversary, I think I didn't need to relive that again. And neither did their family, hmm. or his family. Hmm. You, um, among the many principles and positions that you have fought for over the years, the, the issue of, of diversity in fashion and the role that black models were and were not allowed to play was one of the most significant. And I'm curious about it, it. From the outside, it appears as though there is more diversity on the runway. There is more diversity in what we're seeing represented. Well, OK, let's be clear. Is that true it's, or not? It's getting better, yes. But when, I, when we speak about diversity, we're not just saying black models. We're saying models of all color from all cultures. And we're not making a complaint. The people that I'm speaking about are Iman, Bethan, and myself. And it's just a reminder, because sometimes people get caught up in just choosing white models, white models, white models. And we're like, hello, there are such beautiful women out there. If you could just take a moment to open your eyes and choose with a balance. And I say this because when I started modeling, my two great superior girlfriends, Christy Turlington and Linda Bangelista, I got to Milan, and there were many designers in the, in the 80s and 90s that hadn't used black models or models of color. And when my two friends were picked for a job, they'd be like, we would speak between us, like, what jobs are you doing? And I'd be, I'm not doing that one. They'd be like, why? And then they would say, no, you should be doing it. If we're doing it, you should be. So they would go to the designers and say, you don't have her. If you don't have her, you don't have us. I mean, it doesn't happen now. 
But I mean, my great, my girlfriends and I guess my compatriots and the ladies that I came up with, Linda, Cindy, Christy, Tatiana, Stephanie, we were very caring of each other. So for us, I, we've always said, Beth Ann, Iman and I, that we would rather speak for the girls than the girls speak themselves because they're still out there doing work in every day, going for castings every day. We don't want them to be pinpointed or they're complaining or, you know, so come to us where I don't care. I've had a great, a colorful career and I'm very happy to speak out on their behalf. What was the conversation like with the designers? Because I, I was struck once when you talked about <laughs> oh my God! Models needing to be creative. <laughs> I called up a few, a few from this country, and I just said, you know, you want me to wear your dress in the press, you want me to come to your events, but yet you do not put your girls, your, any girl of color, in your show, or do you put them in their ads? For me, the next step is why are you now not putting them in the ads? And when I say the ads, it's not the ads because there's ten girls. It's the ad where it's that one girl. Why can't that one girl have the opportunity? You know, I did many years ago, but mine happened in a way of, it was, okay, they shot something, they didn't like it, call her in. So it wasn't like I was the first choice, but still I didn't care, I took it, and I made that choice, and I used it to the best of my ability. And then even now, for me, I was offered a job in England about three weeks ago, saying, would I like to be on a cover of a certain magazine? And after being ignored for 12 years in my own country at this magazine, I decided the answer would be no. Because I said, I've waited 12 years for you to now recognize me, and you want to recognize me with eight other girls? It's like, you know what, I'd just rather wait a little longer. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you feel as though the change that you are seeing is driven by a social purpose or a business purpose? Um, some of them are going to say it's a business purpose, but as you can see in the world today, music is, there's a, the culture of music, it's all melting pot, it's all so multicultural, you can't use that excuse anymore. So you've got to give them a chance. And I'm just, every day I see beautiful multicultural girls of all shades of color walking along the street. And it's something that I felt that I now want to take to television. I want to go to television. I want to do this in very rural countries, finding that great face, that great designer. Not to be reality. I don't want to be reality. I've done that. I didn't like it. And um, I like to own it, but not be in front of the camera on that one. But, you know, I do believe there are just to find, you know, a woman with substance or a guy and a designer, someone that doesn't get that equal opportunity and that chance to get on that, to have that stand to show their creativity and what they can do. And I find that in this country, you know, the arts has been cut so much and there's so much great talent out there and none of them are having the platform that they should. You know, a lot of the underlying spirit of the most powerful women um, community is, is about mentorship and as a critical value that um, many of us were beneficiaries of and think it's important to pass along. And you've obviously had some extraordinary mentors um, and been one. Talk a little about Nelson Mandela and how that relationship uh, if that if makes him your, cry, your, your honorary cry. grandfather. I can talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, but in front of everyone, I just get teary, but okay, I'll go. Um, I met him in 1993. I was in South Africa. I actually went out for Miss World, which is a cliche because I didn't really believe in those competitions. And I went out there and this wonderful actor called Blair Underwood explained to me about the ANC. And I was like listening intently. Then he took me to an ANC convention, like a kind of house party. And then I got to hear so much more about it. And then I felt like where we were sleeping was called, the, it was Lost City. But I think at the, it was renamed Lost City, but it was really Sun City, which a lot of people had not boycotted going. And I, for some reason, couldn't sleep very well every night. So I used to go and sleep in Iman's bed with her because when we found out we were sleeping on a grave site, so basically a tribe had been put out. And I felt that energy. So I then decided, you know, I, I got on stage, I just did my thing, and at the end of it, not planned, I just said I wanted to donate everything that I had made on that trip to the ANC. And I'd also taken this wonderful, amazing photographer with me called Herb Ritz, and Herb 
because I asked many photographers to come with me as, to be my companion. A lot of them said they didn't want to get malaria. And Herb said, wow. Herb was like, no, no, I'm going to come with you. And he came and he shot, he shot Nelson Mandela and I, or President Nelson Mandela and I, four times officially. And he shot that beautiful book on Africa that he did in two weeks as he stayed on and while I left. And we were flown to Pretoria the next day and we were in the home with Mr. Man Nelson Mandela. And I'll never forget it. And he had the most amazing eyes. And I just kept saying, why would he want to meet a bad girl like me? <laughs> and um, So why did he? Well, he taught me so much. He taught me just not to be afraid to use my voice. He actually sent me out um, when I came. I went away and I came back again in July, actually with David Bailey. And that's when he made me his honorable granddaughter and made me part of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Then he decided to send me out into the bush. I didn't really have any understanding. I had no knowledge of what the word philanthropy meant. And I got to this hospital, I remember. The children are all dying pretty much of leukemia or some sort of blood disorder. They had made cakes and singing, and I just burst out crying. And as soon as I got back home, he said to me, you cannot do that because these kids have no knowledge or understanding. They thought they upset you. And I hadn't realized that. I was very selfish and thinking, I'm crying because I'm so emotional for them. But I had to learn as I went along. And um, I started to like what I was doing, especially because I was doing it for Grandad and um, supporting the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. And I understood very well when he said to me, one day I'm going to step down from being president because I can do much more being non-political mm. and raise much more for women and children, which he did. Is, was he, what part was he in your deciding to launch Fashion for Relief and how you have thought about Well, actually, the what your before, mission? The, before we called it Fashion for Relief, I called it Frock and Roll. Um, I wasn't really being thinking very well, but I just knew that when they murdered my friend, Johnny Versace, in 1997, because Johnny had allowed me to miss one show of 13 years, and that was to see President Mandela. I th and also because President Mandela only wore those flamboyant Versace shirts with the prints, I thought, well, what we're going to do is Johnny didn't get to meet Nelson Mandela, but his spirit's going to meet him, and we're going to take the show to South Africa, to Cape Town. So 74 of us went trips into Cape Town, and we did the show in the presidential house in the garden, and we did it for Nelson Mandela benefit in, no, Nelson Mandela Children's Fund benefit in Johnny Versace. And it was amazing and so much fun. And I remember in the garden at the tea party, he remembered Kate's name, Christy's name. Everyone was like, started crying, saying, he remembered my name. It's like, you know, because we'd, we'd, we'd all do a picture together, then he'd meet everyone, then he'd leave, go do whatever, then come back into the garden and walk up to them and say, Kate, Christy, Amber, and they just kept bawling. Oh. It was just, it was surreal. I mean, my 20 years with him was surreal, and I still pinch myself and say, why me? I'm still very close to the family, and I do believe I will be going out for his birthday this year, which is um, 17th of July, because of 46664. A lot of women here have, uh, like you, moved from positions of tremendous success, whether in, in political life or certainly uh, commercial and business life, into <coughs> philanthropy, into sort of entrepreneurial approaches to solving problems. And I'm curious now, as you have more and more experience doing this, is there a, in your mind, a right way and a wrong way no. for someone to repurpose their power, their celebrity, their their um, interests in trying to address a cause that they there care about. There is no wrong or right way. I think if you're passionate about doing something and wanting to help, it doesn't matter how much, how little, how big, how, whatever the size, that's your contribution. That's what you can do. And for me, when I started, it definitely wasn't for public adulation. I didn't want anyone to know about it. Um, I would be terrified. I wouldn't let the press follow me into a children's hospital. I didn't want them to see the kids like that. Um, my first thought was the kids and protecting them. And as the world has changed in 2005, when I changed from frock and roll to fashion for relief, um, I understood that I did need the media to get my word out. And I needed lots of people. So I picked up the phone and called. I have no problem calling for other things, but not for myself. 
And the response was great. I have to even say, I'm not gonna believe this, even Donald Trump was great. <laughs> I, asked him, I asked him for money and he gave, he said, how much do you want? I'm like, this is what I want. I did say, well, this person gave that. And he said, I can't match it. And that was it, for a very short phone call. <laughs> and it was just like, and I did that all the time. I, I knew that some people had egos, and if they heard that someone gave more or less, they'd want to match it, so I used it. It doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you get it done, as long as it gets to the right place. But um, I have learned a lot. Um, we changed the format of Fashion for Relief this year. We made it a gala dinner, and we honored Queen Rania, which we'd never done that before. And we did it because going to Jordan in February was, for me, very humbling. You went to the Zatari refugee camp? I did too. Had you been there? Never been there before, and I didn't have any expectations, and uh, I was just blown away by how humble and how generous and how giving these people were, and all they wanted to learn was a skill. And um, it's, and one guy, had, one boy at 13 had three jobs and wanted more. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have a cold. And um, it was for me, and then I hardly saw any young men of like between the ages of 20 to 40. There were hardly any. And they lived in like aluminium tents with no tops. And they, you know, they could put on who, those who were fortunate enough to have gas heaters for an hour. And it's cold where they were. They're in the middle of the desert. But I so appreciate, I'm so grateful to save the children who I was working with on this one. And grateful to Queen Rania and King Abdullah for opening their country and giving them a place to go because all they want is peace. I saw kids under three years old who, they weren't deaf or dumb, but they just stopped speaking because they were so it's traumatized. traumatized. Yeah. And how the kindergarten helped by going three hours a day. They just need a routine brought them back their voice. You know, these things we take for granted. We take for granted that we can take a shower. We take for granted that we can turn on the tap, run a bath, have a cup of tea. You know, just being there puts a lot into perspective and it realizes how blessed we all are. <laughs> you've, you've said that you like meeting powerful people. You've met Vladimir Putin and Hugo Chavez and Barack Obama and apparently Donald Trump. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about what you see they have in common. Oh, excuse me, quality. they like meeting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, they're fascinated about what I do and I'm fascinated about what they do. I can't say that I've ever had a conversation that I've had with President Obama or President Putin like I had. I'd never had a conversation with Donald Trump. Donald Trump used to actually hang out and go to parties and be at the Met Ball. So he was a fixture in New York. So we all saw him. But have I sat and had a conversation with him? No, I haven't. That would be a lie if I said I had. But I know him well enough to pick up the phone and get that money. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, obviously your 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 personality and and determination in this regard has served you very well in the causes that you have championed. You've also written that your personality has probably cost you some jobs and some opportunities. So growing up in front of the world press at 16 years old, you're bound to make mistakes. And unfortunately, I had to live my mistakes in front of the world. But the one thing I do always say, and I will always say, is that I owned everything I did. Um, did I feel shame about certain things? Absolutely. Um, have I dealt with it and moved on? I have. But I will never forget. And um, have I been forgiven? Yes. That's the most important thing to me. Have I changed my life in a way that um, makes me a calmer person? person that's present in the moment and knows what they want. Yes, am I trying to escape anything anymore in my life? No, I'm fed up with trying to escape. If somehow you get this success in some way and you feel you don't deserve it and then you try everything you can to destroy it. And it's so many people that does that. And now I just accept and live in the day and I don't know what's going to come tomorrow and I don't want to. I really do like to live like that. It makes life just so much easier. 
the people that I love know who they, who they are, and the people that love me, I know who they are. And I've got friends in my life that I saw last week that I've known for 31 years mm -hmm. in New York. And, you know, their truth is to me and my truth is to them, and that's what matters. Part of that journey um, has included your own dealing with substance abuse and intervening <coughs> with friends and people that you see struggling and acting as a, well, as a conduit and a mentor to them. How, I feel what does that I was mean? never ever ashamed of substance abuse and when I understood it, I worked so much and I remember in the beginning I never took a break ever. And then finally when I said I want to go away, I didn't know what rehab was. And I chose to pick up the phone, and I chose to make the phone call, and I chose to choose the place where I wanted to go. So that's really part of it, when you make the commitment yourself to do so, and that's what I did. And I got there, and I loved it, and I remember the person that took me, they said, well, they said to me, she has to wear Speedos, full costume, no bikinis, her, she can't. And I was like, why? And I understood because they thought of my job and I didn't want me to be a distraction. That's fine. And then my other friend said, well, well could she like Chinese food on Sunday? Could you please? No, dear, I can't be different from anybody else. You know, we're all, actually, my, my chore was to do the kitchen. I had to clean the tables. And I have to tell you, I loved it. I loved being with all these different people and walks of life, people that wouldn't, I wouldn't meet. You know, I remember hearing someone breaking my anonymity on the telephone because there were pay phones. And I went out there and confronted him. I'm like, I have every right to be here like you do. So do not discuss my name on the phone and do not break my anonymity because that can kill someone. And so that's the reason why in this country, when Pierce Morgan outed me, I was very happy coming out of a, a meeting, smiling. He outed me, but he blocked everyone else's faces. That means you respected their anonymity, but what about mine? So therefore, I decided to fight for my right to go to meetings, which is, it's not, was not correct. All my friends told me not to do it. It was a waste of time. But I couldn't let it go because I didn't feel safe in the country that I was born to go to get the help that I needed. Mm. So I kept fighting. We went through three court cases, and finally I won at the High Court. So now it's done, and there is a law that protects all of us in any type of anonymous meeting. Wow. Since 2005. <laughs> Had a, you talked about how you, you owned the decision um, to address the issue. Have you ever had to intervene with someone who you I do saw all the struggling, time. who didn't, wasn't My, ready? I'm part of an amazing group, and we're not supposed to really promote the, um, an anonymous group. You're asking me about me, so I'm talking about me. And basically, yes, I have many friends. If, my phone is open 24-7. If there's anyone that wants to reach me for that reason, they can. I will always be there for that. And it's because people, I reached out to people and people helped me. And you have to share that to someone else. And it doesn't matter what walks of life, addiction, alcoholism does not discriminate. So, you know, some people don't even know they have it. Um, I realized there were some people that were around me that I thought had some other <laughs> issue. And like I spoke to someone the other day, they said, oh, this girl was really crazy after the event we just did in Cannes. And I went to her and I spoke to her kindly. I said, tell me about what happens when you drink. Do you black out? She said, yes. I said, do you remember what you say? She says, no. I said, okay, so I think if you came to a meeting, would you feel that you would identify with what the people have to say? Because you sound like you have a problem. And she said, yes. So, you know, it's simple as that. It's like, you know, I find that a lot of the young girls come to me because of the job that I, I do, and they can identify with that. But I mean, it's very respectful. You, you plan it, you make it something that's most important to you. If I can't get to a meeting physically, I have a meeting that there's like six or seven or many meetings you can do on the telephone in a conference. And that's what I do with my home group. If I can't get there, I can call in. There's no, and even if you speak to someone once a day who's in the program, that's good enough. Just to admit how you feel and just to say, I'm good today, that's enough. Uh, Naomi, thank you for, for your honesty and for sharing some of this with us, and thank all of you. Yeah.